When we say winter binds, what comes to your mind? What you would find out here is a pictorial representation of what a typical wind turbine looks like. And then there is an example right to, to, your, to the right here to show you how the wind turbine operates. It operates in a similar way to how the blades of the rotating blades of an helicopter works. This is just to give you a picture of the operations of the wind turbine. These blade, wind blades have the application for transportation. They also have the application for generating energy. Okay. So wind turbines are classified according to, you know, uh, three different classifications. The first one is the interaction of the blades with the wind. This is usually referred to as aerodynamics. How do the blades interact with the wind? Under that, I'm going to explain to you what the drag means, what the lift means, and then when you have a combination of the two, how do those apply to the interaction of blades with the wind? I'm going to talk about that. Again, we're going to talk about the classification that has to do with orientation of the rotor axis with respect to the ground. The rotor axis could be horizontal with respect to the ground and it could also be vertical with respect to the ground. So these are various orientations of the rotor axis that we have. So uh, the wind turbine can also be classified based on that orientation. And then the third one is various innovative or unusual types of machines that we have. Things are evolving, things are growing day after day, new technologies are coming up, things that never were are now becoming and then you know, many, many more new things are, are made available. So some of the latest technologies, some of the latest classifications that exist in the real world would also be mentioned under this category. So when we say drag, uh, what are we talking about? You know, we talked about a classification of wind turbine based on the interactions of the blades with the wind. One of those classifications is the drag. How does the blade and the wind interact under the drag classification? The wind pushes against the blade or the sail. In many cases, you know, you have your wind turbine, let's say you have your wind turbine somewhere in the front here, and then the wind blows perpendicularly towards the wind turbine, from the front of the wind turbine, the way the wind turbine is, is installed. The wind blows perpendicularly against the blade of the turbine. So when that happens, you know, uh, that means the blade is blowing at a particular speed, okay, towards the wind turbine. When the, when the wind blows, it, seem, it means that it causes the turbine to rotate. And when that happens, some of the wind, as you can see from this diagram, this is the wind blowing. It gets to the tip of the blade. The blade begins to turn and then the wind goes up and then to the back of the turbine. So a couple of the wind, a couple of the energy of the wind is captured by the wind turbine, and then the ones that are not captured escape to the back. Okay, so part of the wind is pushed up or pushed down, and then pushed to the back of the wind turbine. The, the drag inherently limits the efficiency since the speed of the device or blade can't be greater than the wind speed. For a drag wind turbine, the wind pushes the blades forcing the rotor to turn on its axis. One of the major characteristics of this kind of devices is that it is difficult to protect them from extreme winds. They are inefficient and they require a lot of material for blades. Okay, so uh, this leads to limited commercialization because if it's complex, if it's inefficient, people don't want to invest a lot of money in it because uh, the disadvantages will be too much. It will outweigh the benefits that we're getting from it. And it is popular with, with inventors and home builders as they are easy to construct. So uh, basically, you know, the drug device talks more about a type of wind to bind. The wind pushes the blades, forcing the rotor to turn on their axis, and then a part of the wind that is not captured by the rotor, uh, by the wind blades, definitely, you know, spills back to... Uh, behind the wind turbines. These kind of devices are limited in efficiency. 
the speed of the device or blades cannot be greater than the wound speed. Otherwise, you know, uh, this begins to lead to some kind of damages. So examples of drug devices uh, can be given here. We've got the cup anemometer. Uh, we've got the veins, we've got the paddles that are attached to uh, the wind turbine, as you can see here. So now let's talk about the lift device. This also falls under the category of interaction of wind turbine, interaction of the wind blades with the wind. Okay, so uh, using the lift, the blades can move faster than the wind. Don't forget, in, in, in the drug device, we said that the, the the, the speed of the device or of the blades cannot be faster than the wind of the speed. But when we are, you know, when a wind turbine is designed using lift devices, it is possible that the blades move faster than at the speed that is higher than the speed of the wind. This is more efficient in terms of aerodynamics and the amount of material needed for uh, the blade. For the drug device, you need too many materials and the design is complex. But for the lift devices, you find out that the there are more efficient uh, uses in terms of the materials needed for for the blades. And then here we talk about the tip speed ratio. What is the tip speed ratio? This is the speed of the tip. Uh, when you say tip, this is what we're referring to as a tip of the blades. Okay, this is a tip here. Yeah? All right. So this is uh, the speed of the tip of the blade divided by the wind speed. That is what we refer to as a tip ratio. At the point of maximum efficiency for a rotor, the tip speed ratio is usually seven for a lift device and usually 0 0.3 for a drag device. Okay, you can see uh, the difference. Okay, so here is the diagram to give you an idea. You can see the wind blowing in this direction. You can see the wind blowing in this direction. You can see the wind blowing. You can see as the wind comes perpendicularly, it is lifted right up here and then goes to the back and then continues that, that way. Okay, so uh, you, you can see that more clearly when I mean, you look at it from here. This is the wind flow. This is the wind flow here. All right, so uh, this gives you a picture, an idea of a uh, perpendicular motion of the wind, you know, against the turbine blades and how the interaction works. Talking about the lift devices, when a wind turbine has just one blade, one blade rotating very fast can essentially extract as much energy from the wind as uh, many blades rotating slowly. Okay, so you could have just one single blade. We're still going to talk about this. So if you have one single blade and it is moving, rotating very fast, and then you have another wind turbine with many blades, many blades, and they are moving slowly. The turbine with the wind blade where the wind blade is moving very fast, just one single blade moving very fast, would extract as much power as a turbine that has many wind blades, where the wind blades are moving very slowly. The wind turbine with one blade would save on material. However, a counterweight is needed for balance. So it has advantages because the material you would need for a three blade wind turbine, a three blade wind turbine, you only need one third of that material for you know, the blade of just a, of, of a turbine with just one single blade. So it will save on material in that particular way. However, you would have to have a counterweight uh, balance that is needed so that, you know, everything would, the, the wind turbine would not tear apart or break or fall apart and would have a proper symmetry. So the cost and then the material required to create that balance is also is going to be you know much so the question you want to ask yourself is would you prefer to have one blade and then spend more on creating balance for your turbine or you just have your three blades or four blades of three blades or five blades and then you you can not bother too much about the cost and the material for balance so most modern wind turbines have two or three blades and in the real sense of it, turbines with odd number of blades are better for the purpose of balance. Turbines with odd number of blades are actually better with, for the purpose of balance. So let's take it a step further. So that is the classification uh, with regards to the lift and the drive devices. Now we want to talk about classifications based on the orientation of the axis of the rotor with respect to the ground. 
So we could have vertical axis wind turbines, usually called vert, and then we have the horizontal axis wind turbines called hort. The vertical axis wind turbine has its blades rotating on an axis perpendicular to the ground, while the horizontal wind turbine has its blade rotating on the axis on an axis parallel to the ground. So if you have a wind turbine this way, and this is your ground for the horizontal wind turbine. All right, the axis of the horizontal wind turbine is parallel to the ground, the axis around which the blade rotates. Okay, so for example, let's say this is a horizontal wind turbine. When this wind turbine begins to rotate, it will rotate around the particular axis. That axis around which these blades rotate is parallel to the ground. This is the axis via which the blade would rotate, this axis like this. And then the blade will rotate around, we keep rotating around this axis, okay? This axis is parallel to the ground, it is horizontal, and that is why it is called the horizontal wind turbine. But for the vertical wind turbine, this is the ground, and then probably the wind turbine, the wind blades are going to be like this. So uh, if the wind blades are this way, that simply means they're going to rotate around a vertical axis. This vertical axis they are rotating around is perpendicular to the ground, okay? So the blades are rotating around that vertical axis and that is why it is called vertical axis wind turbines, okay? So let's quickly look at some important details about vertical axis wind, wind turbine. The rotor shaft of a vertical axis wind turbine is arranged in a vertical fashion with the wind catching blades around, arranged around the rotor shaft, yes. So they do not need to be facing into the wind to work because the blades are arranged uniformly around the rotor shaft and can catch the wind from any direction. So this is one of the main characteristics or properties of the vault, the vertical axis wind turbine. They do not necessarily have to face the wind directly. For the horizontal axis wind turbines, they have to face the wind and they have, the wind has to blow perpendicularly against the blades. In this particular case, for vertical axis wind turbines, they are actually designed to rotate around the shaft of the rotor. So they are built around the shaft of the rotor and can catch the wind from any, any direction. The blades catching the wind, spinning in the, the entire apparatus in a circular motion, uh, is, is beautiful, is something that you probably want to see. The energy created by the kinetic effect can then be used to create electrical energy. So the movement of the blades, you know, around the road shaft creates electrical energy. It's not as common as the horizontal, horizontal axis wind turbines, but then uh, it exists, okay, so but not as common, not as commercially viable and uh, 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 available as the horizontal axis wind turbines. The main reason for this is because they do not take advantage of the higher wind speed. For the horizontal axis wind turbines, they can be arranged in such a way that they, 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 can, they can be as tall as possible. So that simply means at those higher heights, you know, the horizontal axis wind turbines can take advantage of the, you know, uh, wind speeds at that higher height. But then for well, vertical axis wind turbines, they cannot take advantage of that at high elevations above the ground. So that has limited their operations, that has limited their availability in terms of commercial applications and popularity. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the, the third classification of wind turbines. We've talked about the first classification that has to deal with the orientation of the blades with the wind. We talked about one of the classifications that has to do with the orientation of the blades uh, with the uh, rotor axis. We also talked about the classification that has to do with the interaction of the blades with the, with the wind. Now we want to talk about the innovative uh, wind turbine designs. All right, so uh, there is a wind turbine design referred to as a sky serpent. Okay, it's just an area of small rotors, as you can see here. We call it sky serpent because you know, it's built like a snake as you can see here all right and then you can see the the the, the rotor small rotors attached to attached to it okay so uh, it's an example of an innovative to bind that that exists all right we also have another one called the highway to bind as you can see here 
Uh, this is a high wheel turbine, okay? So that simply means this operates by the speed of cars. As the cars, you know, move the speed of the cars actually create, generate some, some, some wind. It's the speed of the cars generates some wind speed, and then that wind speed is used to eventually turn the turbines, and then the turbines generate some energy. Analysis indicates that this, that based on vehicle speeds of 70 miles per hour, each turbine could produce 9,600 kilowatt hour per year, you know, for the highway turbine. So uh, this is a creative and innovative concept, and uh, this also exists, of, of course, you know, this is not a commercially available available technology so far. It's not something that is being, you know, installed everywhere in the world, right? But in some specific locations, you will find things like this, especially this is found in the United States of America, sponsored by Arizona State University. All right. So now let's talk about the part of a wind turbine. Having looked at the various classifications of wind turbines, we can then go ahead and talk about the specific uh, parts of, of a wind turbine. Okay, some of the parts that we're going to pay attention to here. So uh, there are key parts that you want to look at here. You can see here we have the cell, we have the tower of the wind turbine, we have the rotor blades, we've got a generator, and then we've got a gear, the gearbox. Okay, so we're going to look at this very briefly. As you can see here, we have the vertical axis wind turbine. This is the vertical axis wind turbine here. And then uh, this is the horizontal axis uh, wind turbine. Right, so you will find out that both turbines have you know similar characteristics. Okay, so one of the things you want to look at here is that this 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 is a rotor diameter for the vertical axis wind turbine. Okay, this is the the blades, the rotor blade. So as the blade rotates around this vertical uh, in a rotor shaft, you, it it creates it creates like a circle, like a circumference. So the, the diameter of that circumference is what we refer to as a rotor diameter. All right, the same thing goes with the horizontal axis wind turbine. Since the blades faces directly to the wind and then they are arranged vertically and then when they rotate, they rotate around the horizontal axis. All right, so their own motion also creates also creates a circumference like a circle, all right, a, a circle. And the circumference of that circle or the diameter of that circle is what we refer to as the rotor diameter, all right? So you can see the rotor diameter uh, as this rotates, and then you can, as the horizontal axis wind turbine rotates, and then you can see for the vertical axis too. Both of them have towers. You can see this has its own tower too. And then uh, what else again? Both of them would have their generator. So the generating unit and the rotor is lo located at the top for horizontal axis wind turbine, while the generating unit uh, and the uh, rotor for the vertical axis wind turbine are, rotate, are located at the bottom, as you can see here. Uh, this is a very important concept and you have to pay attention to this. Okay, virtually every other part that are connected to the generating unit will be located, will be located at the top for the horizontal axis turbine and at the bottom for a uh, vertical axis turbine. So you can see both of them and then you have an idea of what is going on okay we have what we refer to as the nacelle as you can see this is the nacelle here and then uh, uh the nacelle contains the key components of the wind turbine and those components include the gearbox and then the electrical generator so the electrical generator as you can see here this blue this blue box here is called the generator it is located inside the nacelle you can also see the gearbox here, this red red button, this red box here. This is also located inside the nacelle. So the nacelle acts as a housing that contains the key components of the wind turbine. And these components include the gearbox and then the electrical generator. Then we also have what we refer to as a tower of the wind turbine. The tower of the wind turbine carries the nacelle and the rotor. So this is a tower, as you can see. Uh, this is a tower. This is a tower here. It carries the nacelle and the rotor, especially for the horizontal axis wind turbine, right? And again, we have what we refer to as the rotor blades, okay? These are the rotor blades. This, this, is, this is blade. We have three of it here, depending on the type of, you know, uh, number of blades this turbine has. This is, uh, this is also referred to as the rotor blades, okay? So the rotor blades, they capture the energy of the wind and transfer its power to the rotor hub, 
All right, so this is the hub, as you can see here. You can see the hub right in front here. So we capture the uh, energy of the wind and then transfer uh, that power to the, to the rotor hub. So that's the main function of the rotor blades. And then you will see we have the generator here. What does the generator do? The generator actually converts the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft to electrical energy. This is very important. The generator converts the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft to the to electrical energy. What we want from here is electrical energy that can be used for our you know applications so or probably transfer to the grid, the utility grid. So what the generator does is that it, it works to convert the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft to electrical energy. And then we have a gearbox. Okay, we have a gearbox. What does the gearbox do? Uh, it increases the rotational speed of the shaft for the generator. We have, we have the high speed shaft and then we have the low speed shaft. I'm going to be giving you the explanation to these in detail as we move on. In a couple of minutes, you will see those. Basically, we, we want to look at the rotor and then look at the components inside the rotor. All right. Uh, if you scroll up a bit, we talked about the fact that we have this is the hub, and this is, you know, these are the, you know, the, the rotor blades. We have the rotor blades, we have our, the, the, the hub here, okay? So, now we want to look at the uh, detailed information that have to do with the, the most important components of the wind turbine. We're going to start with the rotor. Uh, the rotor consists of the hub and the blades of the turbine. So, if you scroll up, you will see that we already talked about the, the, the hub. This is the hub here, as you can see. Okay, and then this is the blade of, of, the, of the machine of the, of the turbine. So, uh, if you put these two together, um, the hub and the blade together, that is what we refer to as the, the rotor. Okay, so let's go on. So, the rotor consists of the hub and the blades of hub and the blades of wind turbine. It is considered to be the turbine's most important component from both a performance and overall cost standpoint. So one of the most important or the most important uh, component of a turbine is referred to as the rotor. Okay, so pay attention to some of these details I'm pointing out. Most turbines today, uh, they have upwind rotors with three blades. So we're going to talk about the upwind rotors and the downwind rotors too as we go on. Uh, there are some rotors you know, that are located right in front of right in front of the nacelle and then there are rotors that are located right behind the nacelle so when we look at that uh, they're called downwind rotors but the upwind rotors are located right in front of the nacelle facing the wind not behind the wind okay so we will look at that as we go on so uh, the blades on the majority of turbines are made from composites primarily fiberglass or carbon fiber reinforced plastics, carbon fiber reinforced plastics, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then sometimes we, we have some of them made of wood or epoxy laminates, okay? So uh, these are the components that we, we can use to, to fabricate or, you know, produce uh, rotor blades of the wind turbine. So we have uh, upwind rotors, and then we also have downwind rotors. Most of the popular ones are upwind rotors, and then there are some that exist that we can also refer to as a downwind rotors, like I mentioned earlier. And then here we have the glass reinforced plastic, as you can see here, this is a glass, glass uh, reinforced plastic, or just fiberglass, you know, uh, reinforced plastic, and then we have the carbon fiber uh, reinforced plastic here. You can see this is the rotor, this is the hub, this is the blade, rotor blade, and this is the hub. So everything here is what we refer to as our, our rotor. It contains the rotor blades and then contains the hub. All right. Then we want to go on and talk about, now we want to talk about the drive train. The drive train is a very important component. It consists of other rotating parts of the wind turbine downstream of the rotor. Okay. So uh, this, like we said, the rotor is here. So downstream of this rotor, just right behind that, we have what we refer to as the dive tray. So uh, your generator, your gearbox, and then your control mechanism, everything is located within the nacelle. Okay, the nacelle is more like a, a, a cover that houses all of those. So 
Uh, the drive train consists of other rotating parts of the wind turbine downstream of the rotor. It consists of a low speed shaft, okay? And then it also has the gearbox. So the, the gearbox is part of the drive train. The low speed shaft is part of the drive train. We have a high speed, high speed shaft too. But like I told you, there are two shafts. You have a low speed shaft, you have a high speed shaft. The low speed shaft is connected to the rotor side. And then just from the drive train, there is going to be another shaft here. There's a shaft here. There is a shaft here. Let me just explain it this way. This makes it better. There is a shaft right here and there's another shaft right here. The shaft that connects the drive train to the rotor is what we refer to as the low speed shaft. And then the shaft that connects the drive train to the generator is what we refer to as high speed shaft. Okay. Then the gearbox actually, you know, is used to speed up the rate of rotation of the rotor from a low value to a rate suitable for driving a standard generator. The low speed coming from the rotor is not enough to drive the generator. So that is why we need a gearbox. What a gearbox then do is to speed up the rate of rotation of the rotor from low value, okay, to a suitable high value that can drive the generator. So because we need a higher speed, higher rotation to drive that generator, and then the gearbox provides uh, and facilitates that accordingly. Then we have what we refer to as the support bearings as part of the drivetrain too. We have the support bearings, we have more couplings, we have a brake. A brake is like a control mechanism, all right? So I'm going to talk about that as we go on. And then we have some bearings and then we have the rotating parts of the generator. All of these are actually a part of the drivetrain. So we should be familiar with them, their components, and these components are actually connected to the drive train. So if we take it a step further from here, it takes us to another important component of the, of the wind turbine. We've talked about the rotor and the components that are attached to it. We've talked about the drive train and the components the drive train is made of or attached to it. Now we're gonna talk about the generator. There are different types of generators, basically. I and mean, we said the work of the generator is to convert uh, mechanical energy coming from the rotor to electrical energy that is usable uh, by our users or appliances. And there are different types of generators. We have the induction generators, okay? Examples of induction generators are the squirrel cage induction generators. We have the doubly fed induction generators. All right, the advantages of the square cage induction generators is that it is rugged, it is not expensive, and it is easy to connect to an electrical network. These three advantages are very important for our understanding and learning for the square cage induction generators. All right, so the induction generator is used to is used in many turbines installed in grid connected applications. They operate within a narrow range of speeds, slightly higher than its synchronous speed. Then we have a doubly fed induction generator, which is often used in variable speed applications. Earlier in some of the teachings we had, I spoke about variable speed turbines, okay? Uh, and those are you know, turbines that actually operate within a range of wind speed, okay? So they give us a lower limit and they give us a higher limit. So uh, within the limit, whatever the wind speed is within that limit, the turbine is gonna continue to generate power. But outside the lower limit or the higher limit, the turbine is not going to operate effectively efficiently. The turbine is going to stop working. So that's very important. Then we have the synchronous generators. The, the designs entail a constant or you know, almost nearly constant rotational speed when the generator is directly connected to a utility network. So with suitable power electronic converters, either synchronous or induction generators of either type, can run at a variable speed. Variable wind speed generators or turbines are actually, you know, they have a lot of advantages. That I means they, they are not limited to just one speed or just two speeds. We have a range of speeds because the wind is not constant. 
the weight speed varies. Okay, so it varies from it can go from three to four, four, five, five to six, and then come back to three to four, five to six, and then to, to seven. You know, so if you have uh, a wind turbine designed with a generator, and you know, and they can all op they can you know operate with a range of wind speed, it has lots of advantages than just having one you know fixed wind speed for the turbines. All right, let's take it a step further here. So then we have the nacelle and the yaw system. We've talked about the rotor. We've talked about the drivetrain. We've talked about the generator and the types of generators that we do have. Now we want to talk about the nacelle and the yaw system. We want to talk about the nacelle and, and, and the yaw system. These are uh, components of the wind turbines that are also very, very important. There are three important things we are going to pay attention to here. We're going to look at the wind turbine housing. We're going to look at the machine bed plate at the mainframe. And then we're going to talk about the yaw orientation system uh, under the nacelle and the yaw system. So the nacelle cover, or you want to call it a wind turbine housing, is usually you know, referred to as the nacelle cover. It protects the contents from, from the weather. So when we say weather, we're talking about probably uh, excessive irradiation from the sun, we're talking about we're talking about rain, we're talking about humidity, we're talking about temperature and so on and so forth. So the nacelle cover or the wind turbine housing protects the content from the weather. Then we have what we refer to as a machine bed plate or the mainframe, as you can see here. This is this is like uh, the mainframe here and the your system put together. Okay, so the machine bed and the mainframe. Uh, what the mainframe does is that it provides for mounting and proper alignment of the drivetrain components. Proper alignment and then effective mounting of the drivetrain component is provided for by, by the mainframe. Then we have the yaw orientation system, which is a very important aspect of the discussion. It keeps the rotor shaft properly aligned with the wind. So the rotor shaft has to be properly aligned with the wind, and the way to do that is to make use of the yaw orientation system. The primary component is, is a large bearing that connects the mainframe to the tower. As you can see, this is a tower here. Okay, you can see we have a mainframe somewhere, we have the yaw system, and then uh, we have all of those connected to the, the drivetrain and then to the entire, the entire nacelle, basically. So th this, these are important components. We should know how they work together, how they are interconnected. So very quickly, we should talk about the tower and the foundation. The principal types of tower design currently in use are the free standing type using steel tubes, all right? And then we also have the lattice towers, or probably the used troughs, all right? We also have the concrete, concrete towers, and then we have the guide towers for smaller turbines. All right, so these are the four types of uh, popular, four types of towers that we use for, for wind turbines and the four most popular ones, okay? So you can see here we have the, the truss towers. This is the truss towers here, or the lattice type of towers, as you can see here, this is it. And then we have the steel tube towers. This is uh, the steel tube towers here, yeah, as you can see here. Here is a concrete tower, as you can see here. This is a concrete, okay? This is a concrete, concrete tower. And then we have the guide towers here. Uh, this is a guide towers here, basically, okay? Depending on the location of your wind turbines and a couple of other important factors, the tower height is usually uh, 1 to 1.5 times the rotor diameter. So whatever the rotor diameter is, the tower height could be exactly as the rotor diameter or 1.5 times uh, the rotor diameter. So when you are carrying out your design, these are some of the things that you have to pay attention to. Let's talk about the control systems. The most popular and the most uh, used control systems in the wind turbine are the sensors and the controllers and then the power amplifiers, the actuators, and then uh, the intelligence, all right? The sensors uh, control the speed, position, flow, temperature, current, and voltage, okay? So they control that. The controllers control the mechanical mechanisms and electrical circuits. 
the power amplifiers control the switches, the electrical amplifiers, the hydraulic pumps and valves, the actuators control the motors, the pistons, the magnets, and then the solenoids, uh, they, they, they are made up of that. And then we have the intelligence, uh, it, 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 they are basically computers and microprocessors, okay, that actually uh, help the proper functioning of the wind turbine system. And you know what control means? Control simply means that, you know, probably uh, along the line, uh, there would be need for uh, automated services. There will be need for some automated automated activities. Okay, so that's what a control does. In many cases, the sensors would handle that. Sometimes, you know, the brake system is supposed to be applied automatically. Uh, the voltage is supposed to be regulated at some point. You know, a lot of things are supposed to happen as the, as the wind turbine begins to work. All of these control components work together. Setting upper bounds on and limiting the torque and power experienced by the drive train is one of the major functions of uh, the control system. Okay, so uh, they set upper bounds and then it limits the torque and power experienced by the drive, drive train. I remember explaining to you one of the recent lectures teachings that I gave that in many cases, you know, when the torque is too high, which is a rotating force, uh, when the wind speed is way too high than what the turbine can handle, it can tear the turbine apart and destroy the turbine, the wind turbine. We don't want that to happen. So there is need for us to have upper bounds, okay? We, there is need for us to have limits, upper limits, so that we know that, look, beyond this particular point, we don't want the wind turbine to work because it will not be able to withstand that amount of force that will be created when the wind is higher beyond that particular, when the wind speed is higher beyond that, beyond that particular point. So in that case, you know, the control, the control mechanism would have to come into play so that they would automatically sense when the limits have been violated and then they protect the, the, the turbine from, from damage. Maximizing the fatigue life of the rotor drive train and other structural components on, in the presence of changes in the wind direction, the wind speed, the turbulence, the start, starts and stop circles of the wind turbine and so on and so forth. So that is the second advantage of having a control system. And so then they also maximize the energy production. So uh, the control systems, they, you know, the major aspects of you know, ways by which they carry out the activities have advantages in these three areas and we have to be familiar with these three areas this is very important pay attention to them we have the balance of electrical system balance of electrical system so in addition to the generator the wind turbine system utilizes a number of other electrical components so these electrical components are actually incorporated into the balance balance of system okay so they include the switch gear the transformers the cables the power electronic converters the power factor correction capacitors, the yaw and pitch motors, and basically these are the most popular ones that we have to pay attention to, all right, that are enclosed in the balance of electrical system. And as you can see, uh, this is exactly what, you know, this is where it is located and where it can be located. This is very important for us because without them, a lot of things will not, will not happen. It's possible for us to generate energy and not able to transport the energy to where they are used without the balance of electrical system. It is possible that we are unable to generate energy effectively. So uh, to make all of these you know, complete, we need the balance of electrical system. Now, very briefly, we should talk about, uh, we should look at a, a, a diagram of the wind turbine. Okay, and then try to, this is a horizontal wind turbine, by the way, and then try to, try to identify all the components that we've been talking about. When you look at these, this diagram, you will be able to find out that the turbine is labeled with numbers, and each of the numbers are actually represented with their names as a key here. So, number one is the blades. Then you go to the diagram, the figure, you find where number one is. This is number one. So, this is our blade. Okay, you come here, number two is the rotor. All right, so you can see that we said that the rotor is made up of the blades and then the hub. So we have blade, 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 and then and the hub rather. The blades, the rotor is made up of the blades and then the hub. All right, so we can see we have three blades and then we have the hub here. So all of these four are actually 
you know, the components that make up the rotor. As you can see the arrow, this is an arrow going to this blade, an arrow going to the hub, an arrow going to this blade, and another arrow coming to this particular blade. And all of them actually form the rotor. Okay, we also have our pitch, we have the brake system, which is, you know, somewhere here we have, we have a low speed shaft, which is number five. You can see we have the low speed shaft here. And then we have the generator, we have a gearbox, we have the controller, we have the high speed shaft, okay, which is gonna be somewhere, somewhere here, here. And then you can look at all these components and then look at what they represent in, in the key. You should know how to label these in case someone gives you this drawing and then they put this label there and then they ask you to identify the various components. So you should be able to, you should be able to do that. 